Hi, this is Ed Kohler with Extreme Networks, and we're kicking off the new year with a short series of videos on setting up and enabling a Fabric Connect node and its associated services. The agenda is fairly simple. This video will focus on setting up and enabling a Fabric Connect service node, getting it attached to the fabric, and we'll use a few basic show commands at the end to validate the fact that we are indeed attached and have network connectivity. The second video will go into some basic Fabric Connect show commands so we can take a little tour uh, and you can get a feel for what it means to, to kind of look around within the network element. The third video will go further into a specific show command, which is the show ISIS LSDB command, and we will do a detailed tour of the link state database. And at this point, we're going to be looking at the whole fabric architecture as far as the network that I have in the lab, and we'll look at the provision services that exist within the environment. That will give us a good foundational base of knowledge to start provisioning layer two and layer three virtual service networks, and those will be two follow-on videos after that. Towards the end of the series, we'll have additional services. Uh, right now, uh, I'm going to be putting on one for configuration and fault management specifically. And the reason why we're holding it to the end is because we can have a bunch of services within the network that we can run diagnostics against. Uh, so it'll kind of wrap things up. But there may be additional videos that we'll do, such as transparent UNI or uh, perhaps switched UNI or any other alternate configurations uh, that might hit my fancy or any requests uh, from the viewing audience that come up over time. Okay, so without further ado, let's, let's take a look at my lab. And as we can see, it's fairly simple. There are four switches. Uh, switch 1, 2, and 3 have already been pre-configured. So they are running with fabric connectivity. Uh, they have associated services, uh, L2 VSNs, L3 VSNs, uh, multicast enabled, CFM enabled, so more or less totally enabled fabric connect nodes. Uh, the switch we're going to be working with is switch 4. It is pretty much default. Uh, it's kind of a factory default, uh, out of the box, if you will. And our goal is to get this switch configured and attached to the fabric within this video. Now, a couple things I want to call out to this diagram. First of all, note that I'm taking note of where the actual ISIS network-to-network -network interfaces are assigned. And basically, we're using the high-end ports of 47 and 48. Also, let me call attention to this center part of the diagram here where we kind of highlight some global values. And it's important that these values are consistent to each and every fabric node. The ISIS area ID, obviously key for uh, the handshake adjacencies, and then uh, the backbone VLANs, which serve for the substrates for the Ethernet switched paths. Obviously, all of these have to be consistent and match across the domain. You will also see that there are a series of values that are specific to the switches themselves. The prompt, uh, the ISIS system name, the SPBM nickname, uh, the ISIS source IP, and of course the management IP, which we won't configure in this video. It'll already kind of be done on the back end. Really just creating a VLAN and putting an IP address on it and assigning a single port. So beyond that, the other point I want to make, though, is this is a good diagram and a good practice to do, particularly if you have a lab where you're making configuration changes on a constant basis and you really want to know what's what. Uh, but also, you know, in a more permanent network, uh, particularly large networks, it's, it's good to have this kind of information so that you know the physical topology of the network. Um, and that way, when you start to run CFM or various diagnostics, uh, you know, the logical services will kind of come to life against the physical topology. And you'll have a diagram to match that against as far as what you should expect to see. And that will be clear as we move on through various exercises. So the first thing we need to do, obviously, before we go any further, further is to get some sort of command line interface into the box. And here we're using our trusty uh, putty tool. And you can see that I'm interfaced to a uh, DSP4850. That is this box here, uh, which will become switch four. You will note that it is at the default prompt. So that's the first thing I want to do is change the prompt value. And there's a couple reasons why I want to do this. First of all, it allows me to put something specific. If all the switches show the same default prompt, then when I'm looking at tables and things of that nature, there are no differentiating values there. By actually, oh, uh, before I do that, uh, I need to go into Enable, and then I need to go into Config T. Sorry about that. 
And from here, we'll enter the prompt command. Now, the important thing about putting in a custom name is not only the value of having it show up at the prompt, and note how it does take place immediately, and this is a transient value until you save the config. That's another thing we want to note, and you'll see that at the end of each video, I will save the config uh, before we move forward to the next uh, lab exercise. Now, the prompt value also has a role when we run the actual script to activate SPB. And when we activate SPBM, uh, there will be a series of values that we will need to put in. And one of those is the ISIS router node name. And if we if we set the prompt ahead of time, it will pick this up in the script and use it as a default. So your prompt and your ISIS router node name will match and it can all be done basically as one step rather than having to go back and redo your prompt afterwards. Um, so it's just, uh, it's not totally necessary, but it, it, it's a nice convenient thing to do. So now I want to run the script SPBM. And this will bring up a banner. It will tell us that it's going to guide us through the configuration of Fabric Connect. We can take all the defaults. And by the way, if you're doing a new install, there's no reason why you can't. However, this is an existing lab. And so some of the values we are going to pull off of our cut sheet because they're specific to my lab environment. And it's very easy to adjust the defaults. And you'll see that moving forward. The first thing we deal with is the SPB ether type. Uh, as you can see, there are two, 0x8100 and 88A8. Extreme Fabric Connect always installs with 0x8100, and we will take that as the default. Uh, we will also take the SPBM instance of 1 as the default, as we are only running 1. And the point I want to make about the ether type is that 88A8 may be used in certain instances with third-party SPBM. So it's just something to be aware of if, for instance, you're doing an interoperability test between uh, ourselves and another vendor uh, and you're not getting adjacencies, this is one of the things that you want to look at. Uh, now we're into the actual BVLANs themselves. Again, these serve as the substrates for the Ethernet switch path behaviors. So we're going to take the defaults because they happen to match what I have in my lab. And now we will diverge from the defaults. This is a pretty much uh, pre-embedded uh, BMAC, uh, which is the ISIS system ID. I could take this as a default. There's no reason why we couldn't. Uh, however, as you can see, uh, I've got a particular sequence that I'm doing here, and we're going to use that. So it's 00db face dot 0004. And that will become our ISIS system ID. You'll also notice that the nickname is abstracted off of the ISIS system ID as well. And it is the tail end of that address. Now, again, we could just go with the defaults. But again, I've created a specific sequence that I'm using. And we're going to use that because uh, that's what I've defined in my cut sheet. So we don't need to specify the first zero. So we'll just say zero or D dot V4. And that becomes our shortest path source ID, uh, which will be used uh, to service tandem replication uh, in multicast functions. We now need to define our ISIS area ID. And as you can see, I have specified 10.01 uh, for my lab. Uh, so we're going to select that value. So it's, it's very easy to adjust the script. Uh, if you have non-default values you wish to implement, it, it, it's not really a very complicated thing to do. And then here is the ISIS system name. We obviously want to use switch 4. This will coordinate with the prompt, and it will give us very discrete values in all the tables that we'll look at as we move on throughout the video series. And the default for multicast is no. We could do it in a separate video, but I'm going to choose to kind of embed it throughout the series, and uh, we may do something specific afterwards. I'm not sure yet. But at this point, uh, seeing as we are doing the install, we will say, yes, we're going to enable SPBM multicast. I want to note, though, that this is a global value we're setting. Um, we have no services, so you know we have to set them up in the service levels as we move forward. And, and we'll kind of do that in various exercises throughout the series. But right now, we're enabling the global parameter. We're going to say, yes, we want to run multicast. Do we want to run IP shortcuts? Uh, again, we could do this uh, in a separate step. Uh, however, uh, seeing as we're in the script, we may as well. So we'll just enable IP shortcuts and get IP services running at the jump start. 
We need to select a loopback interface. This provides a connectionless IP uh, for what will become the ISIS source IP address. And we will just select one. And now we have to specify an IP address. And as you can see in the diagram, we're kind of looking at uh, 10.004. Uh, it will have, because it's a clip, a 32 mask. And that will become our ISIS source IP address. At this point, it's asking if we want to configure SMLT. Uh, at this point, we will say no, because we do not have SMLT enabled in this lab, uh, and it would make the video far too long. Uh, you know, with the explanatory, we'd need additional slides, so forth, so on. So we're not going to install it at this point. Uh, it may warrant a separate uh, video. Here is where we select our ISIS port interfaces. And as you can see by the diagram, uh, we select as a common theory here in my lab, uh, the high order ports. So it's 147, 148, uh, but the high order copper ports. I'm using copper interfaces here. And this is a request for an ISIS MLT interface. If we're using any MLT groups uh, to establish adjacencies, here is where you do that. And what I mean specifically about that is, let's say I grouped uh, 47 and 48 between switch 3 and switch 2, and I ganged them together in MLT group 3. Um, I would specify 3 here because I would say this is the, inter this is the group I want to run the adjacency on. Seeing as we have no MLT interfaces in the lab, we will uh, just select the default to nothing. And enabling CFM. This again can be done with a separate step. It is not a very complex thing to do, but seeing as we're in the script and obviously in a real world scenario, you would want to implement configuration and fault management as you provision the service node. So we of course will select yes. At this point, we need to enter in a CFM MEP ID, which is a maintenance endpoint ID. Uh, I'm kind of following a simple convention here. Switch number one is MEP ID one, two, three, and so this will be MEP ID four. Now here is where we will again select the default. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about SPBM CFM levels. Uh, we'll cover that on the specific video towards the end, but this is typically what you'd run at the core provider. Uh, so at the service edge, this takes us as far as the edge of the Fabric Connect network, basically the 802.1 AH service domain, so we will select that as the default. Now at this point, you will see that we've run a script of various configuration commands that basically input the values that we have created throughout the script. So the switch is basically done. It is running with SPBM and we can validate that by a show ISIS command. And we see that we are enabled. Uh, we see that we have our system ID, our router name, and our IP source address. Uh, so we're looking pretty good here at this point. Uh, what I do want to do is go in and do a show on the ISIS interfaces, however. And as we look, we can see that they are configured and up and, uh, and the administration state is running. However, the op state is down. Uh, and so we will not gain adjacencies until we change that. So we're just going to go into uh, gigabit interfaces themselves, 147 and 148. And we're going to just basically enable them with the no shut command. Now, once we run this command, you'll notice some changes uh, and some configuration prompt alerts, which will tell us that the link state is coming up uh, and that we have gained adjacencies on port 47 and 48. And due to my naming convention, it's fairly clear. We can see that 47 is facing the switch 1, 48 is facing the switch 3. We can validate this further by doing a show ISIS adjacency. And that will validate that indeed 47 is attached to switch 1, 48 is attached to switch 3, and this is the value of that host name because now everything becomes very, very clear and the uh, you really don't have to be staring at the uh, BMAX or ISIS system IDs. You can actually use these host names fairly significantly. And this will become of obvious value when we run a last command, which is basically to take a cursory view of the link state database that has been created. So we will run the show ISIS LSDB command, 
And as you can see, we have a series of switches that show up in the table. Now, there are multiple entries for each, and I'm not going to go into the technical details of why, but you can see that we have four switches in the domain. Switch 1, switch 2, switch 3, and switch 4. So we are totally attached into the fabric. Uh, we have a valid running config. Now the last thing we want to do before the end of the video is to actually save this configuration. Because if I don't at this point, if the switch takes a reset or for some reason loses power, it will go back to the default configuration. So we will save the config at this point and we are now completed. So it's a fairly simple exercise, really two commands. Uh, we set the prompt and then we run the SPBM script. And at that point, there are a series of values that you have to implement. Uh, but as you can see, you could just take the defaults and the switch will come up and run just fine. Uh, and it's very easy to select other values that you wish to implement other than the defaults, as you've seen in this lab. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, the next videos will get us further into the fabric.